Let's dig a little bit deeper so you get a better idea about the topics that we will talk about in each week. One of the fundamental things that we will do during the second week, next week, is we will review different ways you can look at global digital development, actually how you can measure the advancement of a society towards the digital age. That's important because it turns out that what you look at will also become what you will strive for. That makes intuitively sense, right? So if you focus only on this aspect, because that's what you can see, that's also what at the end you will strive for. So there are several ways you can go about measuring digitalization on a broad societal scale. Uh, the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, of the United Nations, for example, developed an ICT development index. So they say there are three um, uh, components that matters. They have in total 11 indicators. They say it, first of all, matters if a society has a lot of fixed phones, mobile phones, uh, internet connections, so ICT access. And then they say ICT usage is also important if people use the internet and if they have broadband. And third, if in the society there are skills that are relevant for ICT usage, can people read and write to start with? And then they measure these 11 indicators in all of the 200 countries worldwide and create a ranking. So they say, well, this country is most advanced with regard to its transition towards the digital age, and these other countries are still lagging behind. Now, what is interesting, what we will look at, is that there are many ways you can actually measure the advancement towards the digital age. And that becomes quite delicate, especially if you want to influence the transition. For example, uh, while I was working at the United Nations, at one point, I was executing a, a two-week-long technical assistance in a Caribbean country. Yes, I know, it was horrible. I, I, I always told my boss, we have to help Caribbean islands much more. It's, it's really a sacrifice, but somebody had to go. <laughs> no, it was actually a lot of work. So I was there for two weeks working uh, with the national authority, with the leader of the digital development agenda to create a new version of the digital action plan, how to bring this Caribbean island further into the digital age. And during these two weeks, we were consulting with a lot of government authorities, with private sector companies, with NGOs, and got a lot of opinions. And at the end, developed a proposal agenda, which I thought was pretty good, for example. One of the agenda items I remember was that since they are very close to the United States and in the same, same time zone, and since they also speak English, why don't they provide call center services or IT services? In the United States, a lot of IT services are outsourced to India. So they said, well, why don't we take a piece of that pie? We have even better conditions. So let's create an IT service industry, starting with a call center industry. I thought a very reasonable idea. Then the other one, they said in this Caribbean island, we have a lot of problems with natural disasters, hurricanes, tsunamis, and so forth. So let's invest and set up a digital pre-warning system for digital disaster management. Also, a, a very smart idea, and you can use ICT for, for all of these purposes to create employment, disaster management. And then I had to leave, I don't know, three, four months later. Uh, I was wondering what happened to that. So I picked up the phone and called the national coordinator. And he said, well, nothing happened with the agenda. It's right now in the trash. And I said, why? What happened? What happened was that uh, the Secretary of Finance, the Finance Ministry, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, came back a week later from an economic meeting where they have presented one of these ICT development indices. And he found out that this island was actually lower ranked than a neighboring island which there's you know a natural rivalry rivalry between neighboring countries that, that often exists so he said how can it be that this other island is higher ranked than we are um, don't we have a digital development agenda where does all the money go that we dedicate to that you have to understand that the secretary of treasury is one of the most powerful people in any government because you know there's the control over the money so he said, well, we spend all this money on digital development. Why are we so low ranked? He was really outraged. So what they did is they contracted a consultant. And what the consultant naturally did, he looked at how this 
Economic Forum actually measured how it quantified digital development, what they looked at in their ranking. And one thing that they used was how many computers there are in households. Actually, knowing how these things work, and, and I, I've been working in, de in developing these indexes as well, is you often just look at some statistics that are available. And we know how many computers there are in households. That, that's one of the easier statistics to come by with for all the countries. So anyways, in this ranking, that was a very important aspect. So what the conclusion was is that until the next year, they had to increase the number of computers they have in their households. Because the conclusion of that will be that they will be higher ranked and probably will be higher ranked as their neighboring countries, which would mean they would be more advanced towards the digital age. Well, would it? So actually what they did is they took all the money from all these very laudable efforts, digital disaster management, setup of a digital IT service industries, and basically subsidized uh, the purchase of PCs and households. I don't know what actually people did with it. You can watch a lot of movies and download that. It probably had some effects as well, some positive effects, but maybe not as many as these other projects might have had. And what was the problem here? The problem was that kind of like the cart was in front of the horse. And that often happens. What we look at, what we measure, that's what we then also strive for. That's what I said. So it's very important that during the second week, we get familiarized with some of the indicators that people use, and we have a comprehensive outlook on the digital age, which is then represented in the form of the cube, which shows you that there are different dimensions that are complementary dimensions to digital development. And that's where we then start playing with the cube. One of the main themes of the third week will be that technology evolves. This happens through continuous evolution, as you see here in form of the evolution of different generations of iPhones, but also through disruptive evolution. The result of this is that technological progress is exponential. What does that mean? That means that in each time period, as much progress is added as had been added since the beginning in terms of technological improvement. So if we now take the beginning of the digital age, let's take the early 70s, this uh, was one of the first computer games that we had, Pong, and now you see the progress that has been made in the subsequent 40 years, over here, the introduction of Windows, then here multimedia started to join the digital revolution. Now here you have already interactivity, lots of interactivity with the digital medium. And here, 40 years later, you're in a reality where video games cost hundreds of millions of dollars to produce. So this amount of technological progress now, that's what you will see in the next period of doubling as well. So, according to something called Moore's Law, that would be during the next maybe two or three years. So, if you would have been back in the early 70s, back here, and you could have predicted this kind of reality, then you would be now in a position to predict what would happen in the next two or three years with regard to technological progress alone. That's, of course, extremely difficult. So we have to study technological change, try to understand actually how it works in order to reduce this incredible uncertainty that comes with it. In the fourth week, we will then ask how technological evolution leads to social evolution, how technological change leads to social change. The current period of social change has been given many names. The digital age, the post-industrial society, the fifth contrative, we will talk about what that means, uh, the information society, network society, the age of information and communication technology. Now, the realization that a certain period of social modernization is driven by a certain technological system, that, that's actually nothing new. And that's nothing that is particular to, to our period of social modernization. It is actually 
as old as human civilization. Uh, at the time when we climbed down the trees and started to walk into the caves, we started to use stone tools, stone technologies that helped us to improve our standard of living. Then we used bronze technology. We call this the Bronze Age, and then we used iron tools, iron technologies, we call this the Iron Age. And there's a certain pattern you can explain social evolution in terms of these so-called long waves. For example, at one period we used water wheels, the power of water wheels, in order to uh, start a movement of industrialization. This is often called the first industrial revolution. Then we used steam engines. Some people call this the second industrial revolution. Then electrification started to happen. We used electricity. That's a big period. Then motorization, the internal combustion engine, the car, the revolution of transportation, and most recently digitalization, information and communication technology. Studying this results in a theoretical framework where a subsequent and cumulative waves of human progress kind of like build on each other and partially also replace each other. Joseph Schumpeter, who people call the prophet of innovation, of innovation theory, called this process creative destruction because it destroys kind of like the old way of doing things and through modernization creates a new way of doing things. It is very useful if we want to get a deeper understanding of what's going on right now in terms of digitalization, that we understand how this general logic works, because not everything is new in digitalization. As I said, this is a very old logic, and digitalization is just the most recent long way of human progress. In the fifth and sixth week, then, we get kind of like to the core of what this course is about, to digitalization and its characteristics and particularities. That's also why we take two weeks uh, for this topic. When you digitalize information and communication, it obtains certain characteristics. Uh, knowing them is extremely useful because it allows you to even to make predictions. So when you're in your future job, be it in a company or in government or in an NGO, uh, and you are involved in a project that involves digitalization of a specific activity, and you understand the characteristics of what happens when you digitalize, you can even make predictions. You can say, well, if we do this, we this might happen. Or, and, or you can say, why don't we do this? Because these characteristics of digitalization are very important. So I selected 10 of them. For example, the digital footprint is very important. Once you interact in digital networks, you almost inevitably leave a digital footprint behind. What Castells calls timeless time. Then there's the death of distance. Uh, information travels through digital networks almost at the speed of light. Polydirectionality, network structure. Digital networks have an inherent network structure, and we will have a lot to say about the analysis of such network structures, what people call network analysis, or in our case, often social network analysis. Then network externalities. They're very interesting. You might have noticed sometimes it happens that there are different, for example, different apps competing or different social networks competing, and suddenly, one of them becomes the app and kind of like cements its leadership. And it's very difficult to kick this one then off the throne. Network externalities have a lot to do with that. So we will look at what, what that actually is. Then economies of scale. That means that you can take digital content and simply copy paste it. That has a lot of very delicate consequences. Media richness selection, exposure selection, and what I call algorithmification, the fact that we have started to replace a lot of what previously were human decisions, decisions driven by human intelligence, we now replace them by, with algorithms, with artificial intelligence. That starts with the information that you are presented uh, online or in a social network, algorithms take this decision of what you see and what you don't, and goes as far as replacing jobs with robotics through artificial intelligence. In order for you to get to know some of these uh, characteristics a little bit better, have a look at this video here, which was prepared by a former student who took the course. 
How does digitization affect your life? In order to find out more about the characteristics of digitization, let's go through a typical day of an average college student. It is early morning at the University of California, Davis. Jane has just woken up from bed and immediately checks her phone for messages from her friends and family. She realizes that today is her friend's birthday and immediately calls him on Skype. Jane's friend Andy has recently went on a study abroad trip, so Jane uses Skype to call him in Rome. Luckily for Jane, there are many digital applications available so that she can contact her friend. Thanks to the death of distance, Jane is able to contact her friends and family anywhere in the world at any time. Later, Jane meets up for a group project, but after waiting 15 minutes, no one shows up, so she decides to send out an email. Emphasizing on digitization's polydirectionality, Jane decides whether to send out the email from herself to another member or herself to all the members. With polydirectionality, digitization allows for individuals to communicate from one to one, one to many, many to many, and many to one. Therefore, the digital age allows for a more diverse means to communicate on an instant basis. Messages can be sent out to groups and individuals faster to accomplish tasks. Finally, after Jane finishes her class and group projects, she bikes back home to her apartment. Little does she know that Google recorded her entire location history. Because she turned on location services on her phone, Jane can log on to Google Maps to find everywhere she went today. This concept refers to the digital footprint, an automatic recording of information that traces your location history and keeps track of what websites you searched last week. age, think about where you go and what you leave behind online. Be careful about what you post and make sure to manage your online presence. Digitization has made the world a smaller place as we know it. I will be using Amazon to illustrate this phenomenon and highlight certain characteristics of digitization. Amazon has deployed 15,000 new robotic employees in 10 of its U.S. warehouses. The robots are made by Kiva, a company Amazon acquired in 2012 for $775 million. Weighing in at just 320 pounds, these orange machines, which are about the size of an ottoman, can carry up to 750 pounds. The result of creative destruction is that old warehouses are outdated and the jobs previously held by humans are being done by robots. A new system for filling orders consists of closer aisles and machines doing all the work. The death of distance here means an Amazon transaction can occur from any place in the world. An individual can order groceries from the couch instead of going to a grocery store and have them delivered in little time. Likewise, technology has enabled Amazon to ship food from far locations so that individuals don't need to live in the same vicinity that the food was grown, enabling people to live in locations they otherwise wouldn't be able to. Network externalities of Amazon allow customers to benefit from many people participating in reviews and recommendations. The more people use Amazon and rate products, the better experience everyone has. Day 87, and the horses have accepted me as one of their own. I have grown to understand and respect their gentle ways. I know that those who sent me will not relent. They will send others in my place. But we will be ready. These are just a few characteristics of how digitization has shaped Amazon through the use of digital technologies. 
Just as Amazon has been able to bring products to people all over the world, digital technology has made the world smaller through its all-pervasiveness and wide range of diffusion. In the seventh week, we will look at the digitalization of one specific sector. And here I picked the digitalization of science. And obviously I picked that because I'm personally a social scientist. So I'm very excited about that. As a full disclosure, that's the only reason why I picked that. <laughs> but this has, has many interesting areas to look at, which also affect nowadays other sectors. For example, the analysis of big data. You might have heard the term big data. It's not the most lucky word. It basically, for our purposes of studying society, it has to do with the digital footprint that is left behind when you interact in digital networks. Really, for example, if you walk around, when you walk around with your mobile phone, you leave behind a digital trace that then can be studied. It helps us to get to know your personal behavior better, but also it helps us to detect some kind of social patterns from a macro scale. And the analysis of uh, this digital footprint leads to very many new exciting opportunities and also to some threats that we will have to talk about. Now you can use digital tools not only to analyze digital footprints that are left behind in empirical reality, you can also use digital tools to simulate scenarios that never happened in reality and to explore how society actually could be. You can dream a little bit and simulate, and that's also part of social science, modeling, theoretical modeling. How would society look in theory if we would achieve everything that we wanted to achieve? So here you see some examples of some simulation models, uh, computer simulation models. Here, for example, you see the simulation of uh, traffic. Then here you see the simulation of an attack in Los Angeles. And here you see a real military simulation. Uh, that is a mil uh, simulation that is used by the US military to simulate different scenarios in a foreign country. So, so that's also an aspect of how digitalization affects knowledge creation. In the eighth week, we will talk about globalization and human development. That is important for at least two reasons. First, because most people in cyberspace live in a reality that is quite different from the reality you and me live in in developed countries. About every third person that connects to the digital age through digital mobile telephony lives with less than $2 a day. $2 a day is about $60 a month. This reality is quite different from the reality you and me live in, I suppose. So what do we have to do here is we have to train ourselves to look at the world from different perspectives. And now the world looks quite different from different perspectives. And it's not always intuitive, but we have to train ourselves because cyberspace is extremely diverse and the majority of the people live in very different realities. Second of all, uh, digitalization does not happen in a vacuum. Uh, it happens in a historical context of globalization, which comes with different characteristics, benefits, and, and shortcomings that we have to consider as the context in which uh, digitalization takes place. For example, this most recent period of globalization focused a lot on the globalization of the flow of capital and goods and finances, but it didn't focus as much on the globalization of the free flow of labor. You cannot just go to every country and work there, even so you can send money to every country. And the global governance structure, for example, in the form of the United Nations, is at best uh, incomplete. And that provides a quite interesting context that we have to at least revisit and review in order to understand the historical background in which digitalization and the transition to the digital age takes place. In the ninth week, we will talk about the so-called digital divide, the fact that some people are already included in the digital paradigm and other people not yet. That leads to a new form of inequality, uh, inequality in access and usage of 
digital information. And many people are very worried about that because we already have a lot of inequality in our societies. We have income inequality, inequality in education, health benefits, gender inequality. And now we have a new kind of inequality, informational inequality. And, and what are the consequences of that? So what we have to do is we have to study the basic theory on, on the diffusions of innovations, how do innovations, including digital innovations, diffuse through social networks? And how does this process work that creates this divide? Because this diffusion process is what creates this divide. Some people already have the innovation and other people not yet. And then we will also look at the reality of this divide and, and how it has been evolving until now. For example, if you compare the telecommunication bandwidth capacity between the developed industrialized countries uh, and the rest of the world, you will find out that in the year 2001, there was a divide of 10 to 1. That means the average person in the developed world had 10 times more bandwidth than the average person in the developing world. In this case, it was 50 kilobits for the developed countries, 5 kilobits per person in developing countries. Now, five years later, the good news is that developing countries have caught up. They actually multiplied their bandwidth by a factor of 10, now also reaching 50 kilobits per person. That is amazing and it opened a world of opportunities for many for the first time. Many now could access educational services, inform themselves about health, start to do business online, interact with the government and so forth. Really amazing advancements here. But at the same time, the average bandwidth in developed countries increased by an even bigger magnitude. So actually it increased to 700 kilobits per second per person. So in relative terms, the divide increased. In absolute terms, everybody is better off. But in relative terms, inequality between developed and developing countries increased during these five years. Uh, what are the consequences of that? Does it matter? Does it not matter? That's what we will have to talk about. And last but not least, in week 10, we will ask the most important question of them all. So what? So now we spent nine weeks talking about how amazing and how cool digitalization is. So okay, so what to do about it? Well, you can design strategies and policies in order to guide this process of digitalization. And here I will tell you more about some of the lessons that I've learned while I was involved in this and I've been designing strategies and policies for digital development for over a decade at the UN. And I will tell you about some of the lessons that I've learned during the implementation of the Latin American and Caribbean Action Plan for Digital Development. ELAC. Uh, I was very involved and had a leading role in the early design and catalyzation and implementation of this action plan. And this action plan is now seen as a best practice. Uh, it is still ongoing right now. It's in its successful fourth generation. And there are some characteristics and some things that we learned of how to design and how to build strategies for digital development that are very useful. So in the last week, I will tell you more about what I've learned there. So that was now a very quick 100 meter sprint through some of the questions that we will be talking about. And don't worry if during the last 20 minutes or so you didn't understand everything. My ambition was not to teach you something or for you to memorize something. The idea was basically to give you a very coarse grain overview about some of the questions that we talk about. I wanted you to know where we are heading more or less, and uh, I'm looking very much forward to going on this journey with you.